Hi. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm extremely happy and delighted to be here today with all of you. Um, I know you're just coming back from your coffee break, so I hope by talking you'll be coming faster because we have really three very interesting guests with us today. Um, my name is Clea Chakravarti. I'm an editor and a journalist with The Conversation France, a media that publishes analysis uh, written only by scholars for the lay readers. Um, today, our topic of the day is, uh, I mean, of this morning, second panel is how does the emergence of middle classes impact inequality and social cohesion? So I'd like just to come back um, to a post that was written a few days ago by um, someone who is here today with us, Branko Milanovic, who recently wrote on his blog that the world today sees the growth of the global median class and an increase in worldwide polarization. To discuss these issues that showing a, a lot of inequalities and how it inf impact basically um, diverse societies and social cohesion, the fact that we have to ask is are, are these facts related and how? So to discuss these issues with us today, we have actually a very fit panel because we are hosted by at the Institute of the Arabic World. We have two specialists of the MENA with us. And we have also one specialist uh, who will focus on the Southern African shores. So I'm delighted to welcome Ms. Gisela, Ms. Gisela Noak, Mr. Mary Lee Brandt, and Mr. Shanta Devarajan. Mrs. Gisela Noak here is a senior social affairs officer in the Economic and Social Commission for Western Asia of the United Nations. She is a public sector specialist with around 30 years of experience in political and policy analysis and is currently working on the Middle Eastern and North African regions. She will be explaining how the welfare systems and public policies in the region impact social cohesion among the middle classes. We then turn to Professor Murray, Murray Liebrand, who is a pro-vice-chancellor, poverty and inequality at the University of Cape Town, and the director of the African Center of Excellence for Inequality Research. His research analyzes South African poverty, inequality, and labor market dynamics, a topic he will be addressing today. Finally, Shanta Devarajan, he is the Senior Director for Development Economics of the World Bank Group. Sorry, World Bank Group. Previously, he was the Chief Economist of the World Bank Middle East and North African region. So he will discuss how social contract was broken within the middle class in the MENA region. As you can see, all these three themes are well related. And just before going into the details, I'd like to attract your attention to the terms we're going to use for this panel, emerging middle classes. I've asked our guests that they kindly uh, agreed to think of three words each to reflect this category. We won't go into the definition of the category, but I'd like you to think about it and we can come back to it later during our Q&A. So, according to you, Gisela, what would be the three words that come to your mind when we talk of new emerging middle classes? I shall tell you. Yes, so, please. <laughs> I think they are privileged. I think they are under pressure. And I think they are disoriented. Thank you. Please note them down. <laughs> Murray, what about you? I think they are upwardly mobile, but stable and progressive. Thanks. Shanda? I'm going to choose a very prosaic definition, which is the people between the 40th and the 80th percentile of the income distribution. We talk about the top 1% or the top 10%. This is the 40th to the 80th percent. Thank you so much for thinking of this. Um, I'd like to come back to these later. And let's go into our first topic now with Professor Mary Lee Brandt. Um, so the idea is to discuss how do new emerging middle classes, especially black middle classes, uh, in South Africa appear to new labor markets? And how does it impact social cohesion? Morning, everybody. Wonderful to be with you. Uh, my role today, then, is, is to link in the discussion of the middle class and, and its literature to our reflections on inequality and social cohesion. And the labor market clearly plays an important role in that link. Uh, we will use, or I will use, the South African context as my, my background. 
Uh, and what is that context? This is a society that was uh, turned to democracy in 1994 with, uh, if I have to squabble with my Brazilian colleagues, the highest inequality in the world, um, as a legacy of a very uh, divided, polarizing, and definitely not cohesive society. Uh, and the post-apartheid dream, really, was to transform that. Uh, and uh, especially to make the future for the for the children better than their parents had to endure under apartheid. So turning then to, to the middle class, um, and uh, I had a topic here called uh, suspect definitions, and I was gonna say, don't define the middle class like Shanta defined it, um, as some sort of percentage of the distribution, but I'm sure there's a good reason why he did that. So, uh, but for me, Anyway, you need, to, you need to choose a definition. Why I picked upwardly mobile, stable, and progressive uh, is because, and they are somewhat contradictory, because upwardly mobile is not the same thing as stable, but, uh, but forward-looking is what we need. What do we need out of the middle class if it's to play its role? The reason why we're interested in it today is uh, that it's, um, it gives us a lens on inequality, on the distribution of income, uh, but uh, distribution of well-being, distribution of any uh, of of society um, from the middle. But it's much more important than that because it is, uh, in a sense, the growth of the middle class is a sign of a society that is moving ahead, that is flourishing, um, and uh, and is on a progressive track. Um, and so what do you want your middle classes to be able to do as people, taking that then down to people and their behavior? You want uh, people in the middle class to be stable enough and not to be vulnerable to falling back into poverty or any of those vulnerabilities where there's a huge literature showing it makes people very risk averse and it makes them caught in a trap of short termism. So you don't want the middle class to be like that. That's why I picked forward looking. You want them to be stable enough to have an, a, a job that provides them enough security, assets that give them enough security to build. So they can invest in their children. They can take out a loan for education or a bond for their house. That's, and then they can play the role that the political sciences give to the middle classes as being a very transformative social force. But there's an economic foundation that's required for that. So that's how I'm defining the middle class. And in some senses for, for today, it's an outcome. We can look at the growth of the middle class as a sign of the success of a society in moving in that direction. And so our work in South Africa, a paper was uh, presented yesterday. Um, that was a little advert, but uh, uh, on, uh, on, on our work, on the details of our work, but basically we use longitudinal data because it's a dynamic frame of reference. How is the middle class working dynamically? Um, is, it, is it able to be forward-looking? Is it growing? How, how much of, a, of South African society is establishing itself in the way that I'm talking about now? And so we, we, we model that, basically. And the conclusion we come to is that it's very thin. The post-apartheid dream and the reality of the economy and the reality of our society have, have not meshed well together. The reality has been one in which the bulk of the population has really battled. And so the black population in particular, which is obviously a particular focus of our transformative efforts and is 90% of the South African population, uh, has not flourished. And the lens we took by looking at the middle class and looking at the definition that, that looks for people to be able to be forward-looking and not be vulnerable to falling back into poverty shows that uh, perhaps from the, 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 if the top 25%, if, the, if about 4% is elite, then the remaining uh, portion, 20 plus, 21%, could be deemed to be middle class in that sense. It's very thin, it's way out of line with what the, uh, what the market research people call the burgeoning black diamonds of South Africa. Well, in the reality of people, that's not there. 
That's not how their livelihoods work, and it's not how they behave. And the protests in South Africa and the, and the discord in our society correlates with that picture. Okay, moving on then to the, um, the role of the labor market in that. It's very important. It's turned out to be very important in South Africa. Uh, in particular, the characteristics of the middle class are ones where they are in stable employment. They are covered by regulatory frameworks. They're, in the f they're certainly in the formal sector, but even more than that, they're in the, in the managerial, uh, moving towards the, the, the much more stable professional ranks in the labor market. That's what's required to back up from the labor market side the vision. Um, and uh, and that, that part of the labor market has been battling in South Africa. Uh, it, it, it's been stable as a portion of the labor market, but it hasn't been growing. The top end of the labor market, if you like, is what's, what we're talking about here. Um, and so for people trying to grow into that, below that in the labor market has been a much more vulnerable sector. Uh, some of it's in the formal sector, but it's, it's, it, um, it's subject to the fourth industrial revolution, to the type of uh, restructuring, industrial restructuring we've been hearing about in our conference. Um, uh, a, a, a labor market in which there's been an increase in demand for very well-educated South Africans, but less well-educated, but anything below tertiary education hasn't been highly rewarded in the labor market. And so the precariousness that used to be characterized by the informal sector is actually much more deep-seated now in the South African labor market than it was in 1994. And so that's one of the drivers how the labor market undergirds what we see about this very small, disappointingly small middle class. And then below that, there's this picture of a precariat. So, let me just, uh, and then obviously South Africa has then a huge unemployment problem. Below the precariat, the precariously employed, we have a huge unemployment problem, 27% uh, by a very narrow definition right now, um, the youth unemployment of 53%, so you can see the very, very poor mapping on the intergenerational side of what's going on. And, and so the labor market has been a key driver of the disappointing performance of the middle class. What's the solution? Uh, let me just table a few things in closing my input now. Um, well, yesterday, the, our president promulgated our first national minimum wage. We, we have sectoral bargaining that sets minima for the formal sector workers, but we, we, you know, the precariat that's becoming a larger section of the labor market is left out of that picture. And so it's not, it's super important in my opinion. I am probably biased, but I, super important. This minimum wage is a reflection of a social outcome to, to do something about the, the bulk of the labor market that's not covered by formal bargaining uh, in, in the market. So I think it's a very important social outcome in a sense, and it was set as a social outcome process to avoid uh, dire consequences of setting too high a minimum wage, but to put some platform in place. Uh, within the formal sector, there are some real problems too. Um, we've got the highest wage inequality in the world in the formal sector. That's not exactly a space that uh, for high productivity, for trust relationships, for German style coping with, with industrial restructuring, where you bargain things, where you share the gains. It's a highly dysfunctional, unproductive section of the labor market. And let me just table for today that even, even the captains of industry are beginning to understand that the high wage inequality is a problem for them flourishing, even in a profit maximizing sense. Um, and I'll, I'll leave it there with, with one comment. Of course, this maps back out to the broader social project. The broader project, uh, it's not just the labor market. Asset inequality, inequality of wealth, go alongside this labor market performance to lead to a society that is still highly unequal and to lead to this middle class that's very thin. Um, and the broader social project does require that we seek social solutions as well to be a more productive society and a social compact. Thank you so much, Marie. I'd like to um, do. I'd like you to keep a few of your ideas towards the end of 
our, our session. And I'd like to invite uh, Shanta and Gisela to, if they have any questions, to pitch in, because um, I think we have a lot to say. You have about five minutes if you have any questions, and then we'll move to the next speaker. Well, thanks very much, Murray. That uh, actually resonates quite a bit with some of the experience in the Middle East as well. Uh, but the, the one thing you, you didn't touch on, I mean, you, you mentioned that the, the labor market is only part of a much broader story, um, but you didn't touch on what gov the government could be doing to stimulate demand for labor. Because that has definitely been part of South Africa's problem. I mean, the, some of the issues you talked about were really on the supply side. But why, why can't South Africa generate a super rapid manufactured export-led growth, uh, growth model uh, to, to absorb labor? Thank you, Shanta. Gisela, anything else you want to add? Just, yeah, thank you. I mean, I think it is... Um, most probably not o only the overall demand for labor, but also the demand for qualified or unqualified. So what is the structure of the labor market? I think, um, as you said, the low, um, low wage, low value added jobs are the ones which help people out of, out of destitution, but I mean, that, that demand is there. So th I think the demand for which quality of data, how, how can you generate demand for, for labor with, in more, with more higher productivity? So that is, I think, my question to that. Thank you, Gisela. Murray, would you like to answer briefly? Two minutes? Yes, um, with pleasure. So. Uh, let me, let me start by answering Gisela because that's, that goes to the answer to Shanta because it, it explains what's happening from, from the forces of globalization and the forces within the economy. So what's actually happening to the labor market uh, has been well described at the, in, in the conference. Uh, Giovanni Cornia yesterday was talking about this African phenomenon where, uh, where economies seem to be leapfrogging the stage of development in which there's a growth of the manufacturing sector and that becomes a very important part in any of the sort of transition models of development economics. Um, and th that is certainly true of South Africa. Uh, there's a very active discussion of what they call premature deindustrialization. What that means is that the services sector are growing, ha have grown and have taken an increasing share of the South African labor market and the type of people they demand are more skilled, uh, more computer literate type of people. Um, and the manufacturing sector, and, and historically the South African economy has been built on, on mining, certainly, um, but did have a nascent, not even a nascent, uh, quite a big manufacturing sector that the apartheid government stimulated under infant industry conditions. And that, the existing structures have really battled. So mining has, has battled over the post-apartheid period. Some of that's about international prices. A lot of it is about global demand patterns that then feed through. We haven't coped with that very well as a country in a social cohesive way. Um, and then manufacturing did really take a hit when we liberalized our, our tariffs uh, in the 1990s. Um, and again, we didn't adjust well. We're a very fractious country. We don't have the capacity to adjust. So from the private sector side, that's the answer. Um, what can government do about that? It's very hard. We have a super uh, compet uh, uncompetitive structure as an inherited legacy. We have a very unequal, uh, an unequalizing structure of our economy. And so the Competition Commission has become much more active. Uh, government really is very tempted with the notion that government is the employer of the last resort. And that's uh, quite a difficult and queasy notion. Um, but recently, they've come to couple that with some sense that maybe an intervention that copes with the youth unemployment issue and the employer of the last resort is a way to go that will actually have some serious impact on this discussion of inequality. Thank you so much, Mary. Um, I'd like now to invite Gisela uh, now to discuss why and how the welfare schemes matters and how can it be implemented among emerging new middle classes with a particular focus perhaps on non-state actors. 
Um, you have about eight, ten minutes as well. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. I try to keep time. Um, so thank you very much for this invitation and thank you also for, um, for the last two in exciting two days and uh, for forcing me to think about this in this particular way. Um, so I will start with who are the middle classes in the, in the Middle East. And I think what, as a rule of thumb, we tend to say that um, they are the formal people in the formal economy. So people in the formal economy are mainly public sector, public enterprises, some private enterprises, um, the banking, and then independent professions like lawyers and, and doctors. So the share is about 30 to 50 percent. Uh, it varies across the countries. But what I want to talk about more is um, where do they stand socially? Um, so it, it seems that the middle class in the Middle East is very close to government or even equal to government. And that has enormous consequences in terms of social policy, social cohesion, and, and so on. So the characteristics are educational, so at least secondary education. We don't know, as uh, my colleague said, um, about property, which is a very, very important factor, but largely unknown in the Middle East. Um, and it is about privileges, so job security, working conditions, um, pay not that much, but um, social security coverage and quite generous. So the question is, why is this so? And there we come to what Chanta will elaborate most probably later on. Um, welfare systems um, and as labor markets reflect social power relations. So it is in the Middle East and across the board, you had in the traditional way countries came from after independence, you have uh, public sector employment as the main job, the main security system. Then you have uh, and public sector employment with social insurance. Then you have subsidies across the board, and you had the public provision of social services for free. So this is still the setup, for example, very clearly in the GCC, in the Gulf countries. Um, but they start, the heat is on. So you see a number of, a, a big pressure, and this is why I'm saying under pressure, pressure coming. Um, in the, even in the Gulf countries, uh, public sector employment runs, to, runs out. It's no longer possible. And the private sector is not able to take over, not ready, or not ready to take over under the same privileged conditions. So the, you may have heard about this transformation plan in, in Saudi Arabia. The core of these reforms is to encourage, enable, support um, the private sector to take over in an organized way. So that is one of the key words because under other countries have felt the heat earlier. They, have, they went there. Um, public employment decreased, public services deteriorated, which is very important. Subsidies still were on but are now phased out. And, um, but the entire, what I say, private sector takeover was by default and not by design. So you had a very big growing informal sector and a de facto privatization of public services, of social services. So then the private provision of services comes for profit and non for profit. For profit needs a strong regulation. So you need the state to be capable to regulate these services, the provision of these services. And when private sector takes over by default, it is not always the case. 
So the regulation lags behind. Then you have the non-for-profit sector. And that is um, very interesting because um, some, in some cases, in some countries, the private provision follows sectarian lines. So you have Christian schools, schools for Christian sh children, you have Muslim hospitals, mainly for the Muslim community, you have faith-based organizations bringing social services, and very, some in very modern ways, so like conditional cash transfers. You, you attend, or your family, your children, your wife attends a religious course, and you get the transfer. Um, so states may, in, in many cases, walk a very thin line here. So yes, private initiative, also middle classes, is important, but it's the way how they are provided, and what do you want? Um, private sector, also these uh, private provision of schools and hospitals, do not always serve all income groups. So it is organized by the middle class for the middle class. Um, the cash transfer programs, which I talked about earlier by faith-based organizations, yes, they target the poor. But uh, the, the public services are mainly in group and horizontal distribution. Um, so I want to conclude by four points, what I think comes out of that. And in the spirit of the Agenda 2030, um, I think this is somehow true for developed and developing countries. Um, the type of social cohesion you organize or which prevails in societies depends on how welfare systems are constructed. So welfare systems are very, very important for the structure of social cohesion in society. It is inform they are informing, uh, they're deciding about the degree and the kind of redistribution. My second point will be with all sympathy and support for supporting the bottom 40%, um, the safety net approach still maintains that division between privilege and the rest, between the formal and the informal. So it still reflects the unequal power relations in the society. So we need to go beyond that. And I think we need to better integrate the different parts of the welfare system. And there we go also to the labor market, which is basically the insurance uh, and the wages and how you structure the labor market. So we are currently in ESQA, we are struggling with that, breaking our heads, and we would appreciate any support from any smart people. So the third port point would be um, the middle classes may care more about poverty prevention than poverty alleviation. Um, and in this case, I think social insurance is much more important than social assistance, but it needs to be more flexible. So it needs to be able to integrate broken careers, so uh, broken employment histories, like in informal work and informal work. So it needs to enable social insurance systems need to be reformed in a way that they enable portability of benefits and all of that. And then I think my last point is we need more attention to public goods, which had been mentioned before, and which also resonates with the, um, with the attention to the comments of the um, AFD before. Um, good quality public provision of health and education, but also of housing, which is a very, very important. And my colleague from Morocco mentioned the cities. The, the divide is a smart form of the redistribution and a buffer for economic shocks. Thank so you so thank you very much. Thank you so much, Gisela. Um, so we're going to open the question to the audience uh, in 10 minutes. So if you don't mind, I'd like just to Shanta to uh, pitch in and continue on this discussion because you're going to discuss on the MENA as well. Thank you. And you have about 10 minutes. <laughs> Weren't you going to ask me a question? Or, oh, yeah. oh, you want... 
Um, just the, the, the discussion we had about the MENA and basically how the social contract uh, with the middle classes in the MENA region was broken, and you can please do discuss what Giza just said as well, if you can, if you want to. Okay, <laughs> in five minutes. Okay, thanks <laughs> very much. And it re really is a pleasure to be here and get back together with friends that I haven't seen in a while. Um, and I think there, there is a common thread coming through this. Uh, and I, I'm trying to, gonna explain why I've insisted on this 40 to 80th percentile. Um, if you look at the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, for the first 10 years of the century, from 2000 to 2010, you had fairly rapid growth, four, four to five percent. You had poverty was declining, and very close to, to three percent or, or whatever. And income distribution was not particularly high. And in some, some countries, uh, I mean inequality, and in some countries was actually declining. Right? Um, and indeed, uh, when we, uh, we talk about the bottom 40%, the incomes of the bottom 40% was growing along with mean incomes in, in these countries. And yet we had revolutions in four countries, uh, civil wars, protests, demonstrations. So what happened, <laughs> right? Now, if you look, if you leave all of those statistics aside and look at just one indicator, which is the life satisfaction index calculated by the Gallup World Poll, the, the Cantrell Index, that asks people, do you consider your life better this year than last year? In, on that index, and it's a global poll, MENA was the least happy region in the world. Right. It was worse than almost all other parts of the world. Actually, the only exception being South Africa, <laughs> but, <laughs> which is kind of interesting, too. Um, but the other thing is, if you look at within the MENA region, it wasn't the poor who were least uh, dissatisfied. If you broke it down, it was that population between 40 and 80th percentile. They were, they were even, even more dissatisfied than the bottom 40th percent. And I think this, if you look at this, this kind of explains all of those statistics which seem counterintuitive. Because what was happening in the region was, and, and this goes back to uh, Gisela's point as well, uh, that, that public employment was declining. And that was the employer, not just of last resort, but first resort. Um, and uh, so unemployment was growing, particularly among, as Mr. Baraka said earlier this morning, among the educated. You have three times as many educated people unemployed as you have uh, less educated people unemployed. And this, this led to a profound dissatisfaction among the middle class. These were the people who were getting squeezed. And they're the ones with the aspirations. They're the ones who went to school hoping to get that government job and be set for life. And their aspirations were shot at this point. And the, it got to a point where they rebelled. Um, and continuing to in some, in, in some cases. And, and that's why I characterize this as a broken social contract, because if you go back to almost every Middle Eastern country had a very similar social contract. The state would provide subsidized food and fuel. They would provide free health and education, as Gisela was, was mentioning. And they would provide jobs in the public sector. And in return for which, the population kept their voices quiet. The, all the measures of voice and accountability in the Middle East are lower than the average for uh, other countries with the same levels of, of, of income. Right? What happened in the early 2000s was that that social contract was broken. The state was no longer keeping its part of the bargain, which was to provide jobs. And that then meant that if the state wasn't going to keep their part of the bargain, why should we keep, the citizens keep their part of the bargain. And that's what erupted. Now, the real question going forward, and we can discuss this afterwards too, is what do we do now? Because as we know, the Arab Spring has not ended well in many countries. They've gone into civil wars. Uh, there's constant tensions, constant eruptions. Okay. And there's some, some forces are trying to reproduce the old social contract. And that's what we have to be, watch out for, because that's not going to happen. That's not going to work. That co social contract has failed. So we have to think of a new way 
in which the state is not an employer, but a facilitator of the private sector. So you mean a, a new social contract as a solution, but is it, is it possible? I mean, do you have any examples yeah. coming so forward? There, there, or are, there, are, has... there are elements of this that there, people are, are, are trying to do. And let me say that, let me add, and this is a comment on Gisela's point as well. While the state provided free health and education, the quality of both of those was extremely poor. It became poor in those, and it, it, is, it is so poor that the private sector emerged as, a, as, as an alternative. That was the, the I mean, look, 80% of the students in Egypt go for private tutoring. That's not even a, a poor thing. It's, it's, it goes all the way to the, you know, I, the 80s. I think Gisela would like to correct. Okay. Would you? Yeah, I mean, I, I totally agree, but that is, doesn't mean that we should even more encourage the private sector. No, no, I, I didn't say this, that. <laughs> this means that the, the public sector needs to regulate better if you go for profit provision. Okay. And, I mean, okay. Okay, no, no, that, no, no. <laughs> Mar Marie, maybe, do you, do you like to pitch in or shall we open the, the questions to the audience? Just well, I, just want, I do think that there's a, there's a very important point emerging here about the role of the state in this whole deal. And, and Shanta's very telling phrase that we can't rebuild the, the social contract on the old rules. Because my point about the, the South African state, and you asked a question about employment creation, and so I said, well, they, they're tempted by that notion. But it leads them to avoid the point that they do have key found, foundational roles to play. Uh, for all citizens, but also for the labour market around s infrastructure, if you like, uh, and, um, and education and health. And they've done that pretty badly on all counts. And so, in a sense, th that's why I was wary of this notion of, of the state seeing its role in this as the employer of last resort when there's very foundational things that they have to put in place as the bedrock. Th those exact things, quality education, quality health, but then also the infrastructure, electricity, transport for all of the citizens, including the workers and those looking for jobs. Those are the absolute key roles of the state, I think, in the new social contract. Thank you so much. From what is, what is my understanding, we are going from basically talking about the emerging of the middle classes linked to social cohesion through the question of the place and role of state and private sectors uh, in, in this new social contract, which is, I think, a, a whole new topic of research, which, which would be quite interesting to discuss now um, with our audience if there are any questions. Please. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, can we have a mic, please? Thank you. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Ravi. Uh, I am uh, a doctoral student at University of Paris -Thres. Uh, I'm curious about two points here. The first thing is that when we talk about the middle class, so we know that it's not a homogeneous term. There's an upper middle class and there's a lower middle class. So in terms of advanced economies, what we are seeing is that this gap between the income of the upper middle class and the lower middle class is extending, at least for the last 20 years. And uh, case in point is, for example, Germany. We talked about the labor market, and after the labor market reforms in Germany, what we saw is the fact that the expansion of, uh, of non-standard employment forms, it's grossly expanded. Now, Germany has, uh, I think, the second largest low-waste sector in, in, in Europe. So these kind of issues, I think, they are more important when we look at advanced economies. Come to the second point about the developing economies. I'm from India, and what I see there is that the kind of inequality that, that exists in the society, it's beyond statistics. Because uh, a major point here is that the gap is between the rich and the poor, the middle class and, and, the, and, the, and the poor. And this gap, I'm curious to know, especially from the South African experience, do you think that the best scenario for countries like India is to, I do not know, evolve into something like Turkey or South Africa? So that is the, the upper limit they can achieve because I, I don't know how would they, the middle class in India or such countries would be able to get out of uh, this issue. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, maybe Marie Shanta, you would like to answer? Yeah, sure. Uh, I'll start on both. And I, I think you're surfacing something uh, very important in terms of your definition of the upper and the lower middle class. 
because in our work, the reconciliation, in a sense, with, with Shanta's definition, is our class that we, we refuse to call the middle class because they don't have the stability that they need to be forward-looking, uh, but they're not poor. They'll be above the poverty line is exactly that uh, 60 to 80 percent, which you're calling the low middle class. And the, the difference in the, the realities they're facing right now is profound. And so Gazelle is even calling her middle class privileged. I think the uh, South African middle class would feel quite offended in a long run historical sense to be called privileged, but they are much different to the vulnerable uh, just below them. So I'm endorsing your point as being very important on many counts. Um, yeah, that the, I'm not sure I've got anything profound to say about Turkey, so, Turkey, India, and uh, so uh, all that I can say is that you do start from somewhere. This idea of initial conditions, your, your prevailing reality is super important. And so I can't see any scenario in which uh, India, which is way less uh, unequal in South Africa, by the way, but has a very different texture to that inequality. It needs its own detailed interrogation. And I guess I'm, I would argue in favor of the fact that we're all in a globalized world, but these, these social realities and social responses do have country specificity to them. And there's no getting away from that because the social fabric is different and the actual economic manifestations are different too. Thank you, Mary. Shanta, please. Um, yeah, I'll take the second question uh, on India. Uh, First of all, I think you're onto something because almost all the indicators I've seen outside of the standard Gini coefficient for India show that its ex inequality is extremely high. I mean, for instance, the, the share of wealth owned by the top 1%, which, for which we only have data for a limited number of countries, but India is still near the top, uh, uh, higher than the United States, for instance. Uh, so uh, I think you, you, you're onto something. Now I think one of the reasons for that is what Jamie Galbraith was saying earlier this morning, which is that India's manufacturing sector has not developed. India's growth, all this growth that we celebrate, is really in the in the services sector, and within the services sector, it's in the high skilled services sector, uh, and that can be also be unequalizing because that, those are high skilled people whose whose rents are are, are growing. Uh, very rapidly. And just to give you one example, when we talk about the middle class, you know, we, we think of people who maybe are like us, only a little bit poorer. And that's just not even close to what the story is in India. Just to give you one anecdote, so <laughs> some of you may know Lant Pritchett. He was living in India at the time. We were having dinner at his house. And that was the day that the national statistics had come out. So, you know, being a bunch of geeks, we pulled out our laptops and we decided to find out where Lant's cook was in the income distribution, because we knew her income, <laughs> because he paid her. <laughs> and it turns out she was in the 92nd percentile of the income distribution. So th that's, not, that's upper middle class, if you really want to think about it in the income distribution terms. Um, and, and that's what we have to be talking about when we're talking about this. Thank you so much. Um, Gisela, would you like to react? Yeah, and yeah we'll just some more briefly. I think um, what you, the point you're making is that um, confirms that when we talk about the middle class, it gives the impression of stability. So you have crossed that line and now they are safe. But this is not the case. So there are people in and out. And therefore, I think what is very much, um, and especially for the educated, People. So it's no longer the total equation of educated people are in the middle class, no. With this youth unemployment thing, at least in the Middle East, you have educated people, very well educated people in the informal sector. So what, what I would say is the point is that you need to construct your welfare system in order to keep those people safe, even if they are in and out. So you, they have to be flexible enough Social insurance has to be flexible enough to give those people, even if they are in and out of the labor market, even if they run into poverty, some sense of stability and of social cohesion. Thank you so much. So we have a few more questions. Uh, I'll take Sir here, and that, then we have three questions uh, on that side. Uh, sir, if you'd like to just keep it briefly and just introduce yourself as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is Joachim Heidebrecht from KFW Development Bank in Germany. Um, I, I would like to ask the panelists how you perceive the political role of the middle class, their role in 
with respect to, to keeping government responsible, accountable for the role in uh, restricting elite capture and um, change the spending pat social spending pattern of government. Are they agents of change or are they simply an enlargement of the elite? Thank you. Maybe just one answer and then we'll move to the next questions. Whoever wants to. Shanta, perhaps, since it falls on you. <laughs> Uh, so the, the real answer is much longer than what we can uh, discuss here. No, there, there's no question that the, when people enter the middle class, their, 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 their needs become greater in terms of the politics. They're actually demanding more in terms of social stability, in terms of uh, accountability. You find that you know, the polls show that the middle class are the ones who actually, once they've got the basic services of you know, childhood diseases and basic education, that's what they now want. They want government to be accountable to them. So they can be a very powerful force. At the same time, if the government is not delivering, as this is what we observed in, in, in the Middle East, then they become actually the agents of trying to work around the government. Uh, so when, when they found that the government was not delivering jobs, they, they initially went into the informal sector. And, and let me add, and this is something we are discussing in the green room earlier, um, that actually might explain why the Middle East has such a low uh, uh, labor force participation rate for women. Uh, because what happened is that women were employed in the, in the government jobs, then their government jobs stopped. Uh, the men went into the informal sector, but the informal sector is very hazardous for women, and there's very little protection. And so the women dropped out of the labor force, even though they were more educated than the men, that what we have now in the Middle East is, is the lowest labor force participation rate in the world. Thank you. If, if I can just have a short answer, my short answer to your question would be, look at the tax systems. So there you see very clearly the political role of the middle class and the structure of the tax system. So in the, in the Middle East, it is mainly VAT and uh, resource rents. Low income, low poverty tax, all of that. So there you see very clearly the political role of the middle class and that needs to change. Thank you. So we had a question here, sir, then sir in front and sir behind. Thank you. Merci, madame. Mon nom, c'est Abdelaziz Awam. Je suis un ancien secrétaire général du ministère de l'eau au Tchad. Et j'ai eu le privilège de gérer aussi des projets, euh, une cellule de projets AFD qui finance les secteurs de l'eau. Euh, je suis, euh, pour l'instant, je, je vais d'abord corriger... Euh, si, si vous pouvez euh, juste poser la question, s'il vous plaît, parce qu'on n'a pas beaucoup de temps. Voilà, voilà. Je vais, je vais juste aller poser la question. Parce qu'on parle des inégalités. Pour moi, il ne faut pas faire de l'économie sur le mot. Euh, inégalité, cohésion sociale et, euh, et autres. Mais moi, je vais dire injustice sociale. Parce que moi, je viens d'une un, région du monde où euh, l'injustice... Où on ne parle même pas d'inégalité, on ne parle même pas de cohésion sociale, on parle de d'un pour cent extrêmement riche, 90 pour cent dans une misère noire et peut-être une, une, 10 pour euh, cent sont peut-être dans la tranche moyenne que vous vous dites. Et quand tout à l'heure Madame Alicia a parlé de, de de la pauvreté se trouve en Amérique latine. J'ai dit, mais Mme Alicia n'a pas beaucoup voyagé. Il faut qu'elle parte en Afrique pour voir ce qui se passe chez nous là-bas. Je témoigne ici pour remercier l'AFD pour les merveilles qu'elle a fait pour le Tchad. Ils ont fait beaucoup de projets et on a, ils nous ont aidé à réduire le conflit agriculteur et le verre qui était vraiment énorme chez nous. Et là, l'AFD a vraiment amené des, des solutions. Merci, merci monsieur. Donc, merci. Si je comprends bien, vous, vous posez la question de, de l'injustice sociale sur les termes. Peut-on prendre... Can we take um, the other two questions and uh, les, les personnes vont répondre éventuellement. Um, so there was someone just behind and someone just uh, at the bottom front, please. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Um, my name is Isabel Brachet. I work for ActionAid, which is a non-governmental organization. Um, I was very happy that the issue of privatization of public services has been discussed, even if there seems not to be total agreement between the panelists. Um, I just wanted to flag that Philip Alston, who is a United Nations Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty, issued just a couple of months ago a um, report highlighting how privatization of public services is increasing dramatically inequalities and is a, is a threat to the realization of human rights. And on this I have two questions. One is whether you believe that um, all public services um, could potentially be open to privatization or whether you consider that certain areas are not compatible with for-profit activities. And my second question is around the drivers of this privatization of public services. What are they beyond ideology? Uh, both domestic drivers and international drivers. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Um, sir, if your question is not on the same topic, I'd like them to answer. Okay, great. We'll take yours just after that. Thank you. Uh, if with any of you would like to answer, maybe Gisela, because public sector and private sector is your thing. And you'll take it. The justice social, okay. I'd like to oh. uh, sure. come in on the private, because I think it's a good, it's a good point. But I... Uh, um, I, th I think that that the framing, like of it's you're either privatized or you're not, uh, and and uh, uh, without asking the question about okay, what do we want out of these these um, public sector organisations? What's their purpose? What's their role in our development plan? What's their even if hopefully the state takes on board that its purpose is to is to be inclusive, inclusive economic growth, bring down inequality. That's the purpose. Uh, because the counterposition between public and private misses the fact that, for example, in South Africa, the state, uh, the, the public sector uh, provision is, is really public sector provision, and there's a very anti view about privatization. But the elite, the public sector elite, and the ruling party captured the private, the public sector for its own ends with a huge failure of the people. Um, and uh, and the only th so there's a lot of discussion and debate about that. The only thing people seem to agree about that is that privatization is an anathema. Well, compared to what? Co compared to the existing reality, um, you know, uh, I, I for myself. So, for example, the, the the state airline is a public sector state-owned enterprise, huge loss making. I don't see why we need a, you know, if it's captured by the state and it's absolutely useless and it's taking billions and billions of South African rands to bail it out, I think we should get rid of it. Uh, just in the sense that it doesn't have a key role to play. Then there's something like the electricity supply, which is also hugely dysfunctional. South Africa right now is on a huge blackout because the state-owned enterprises. Uh, so we all know from international experience that privatization has its own perils, and I'm not arguing for that. I'm just arguing for a nuanced discussion that makes it very clear that the reason we need electricity is because it has to support the citizens of the country to do what they do. And, uh, and in South Africa, there's a whole menu of, of public-private partnerships that are perfectly possible that greatly increase the environmental sustainability of energy supply. I do think the state should be in control of that, but I want some nuance in the discussion. Thank you. Maybe Gisela, you'd like to... Yes, to I think I would agree, but I would also add that privatization does not prevent capture. Right. So um, it, the capture, the danger of capture... Uh, is equal in the private provision and the public provision. So we need to see how we can regulate that. And yes, I, I, I think it is a, a problem that uh, if you have the state, the regulator, and the provider, and, and everything in one role, there is an increased... Uh, but when you have a crowny society, you have that still in one role. So the question is, how do you organize? I mean, we have uh, gone through uh, privatization of uh, public services. Then the state has been buying back companies um, from the private sector because it didn't work. So I think that is a very, very crucial element. How do we organize 
the provision of public goods or semi-public goods even. So the infrastructure, the, the health, education, housing, all of that is a key element in the discussion on social cohesion. Thank you. Shanta? <laughs> I'm going to disagree a little bit with the terminology here. You talk about privatizing public services. It's as if somebody consciously decides. Some policymaker wakes up in the morning and says, OK, today I'm going to privatize public uh, education in, in my country. That doesn't, that's not how it works. These private schools are usually, they emerge organically because parents are so frustrated with the quality of public schools. I mean, we have lots of evidence now in India, in Pakistan, in Tanzania, in Kenya, where there are free public schools in, these, in rural areas, but the teacher's not there. So parents get together, because they're desperate to get their kids an education. They get together and hire a high school graduate from the village and have her teach those children. And they charge, they, they pay, uh, uh, each parent pays th uh, $3 a month. So this is completely, it's, there's no government involved. The only thing the government has done is to mess up the, the public education system so that these schools emerge. So th this is not a policy decision. It's a default from, from what is done. Now, ha having said that, it, it's true that, it, it's, that these parents have to pay this kind of money because $3 a month is still a lot for when you're earning $100 a month. Uh, um, and uh, so they, they have to do something about it. But so what, we're, what, we, what we, you can't wish them away. You can't say, well, we shouldn't have these private schools, right? What we need to do is to figure out a way to regulate them, as, as Gisela says, and actually provide enough information so parents can actually make a choice. Mm. They can see, because some of, these, some of these private schools that come up are, are really price gouging, too. Um, but if you can get the information about the quality of the schools, you might be able to, to, to get there. Um, let me, I, I like this question about la justice sociale, uh, social justice, um, because I think you're, on, you're exactly right that what many of the people in the Arab Spring, Spring were demanding was social justice, not a reduction in inequality. Uh, in fact, the, the slogan was bread, freedom, and dignity. Uh, that was, uh, uh, so, so bread was part of the inequality, if you like, uh, but the freedom and dignity were actually about uh, uh, social justice, and I think you're, you're absolutely right to point that out. Thank you. We had a question, this gentleman at the, at the front, please. Are there any other questions? One more here. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. We'll take you, sir, and after the answer, two more questions on that side. Thank you. Uh, I'm Andrea Cornia from the University of Florence, and I think that um, it is quite interesting. I think there are sort of uh, resemblances between uh, the Soviet model and uh, the MENA model. Both have been uh, a high component of statism, and uh, so guarantee for employment, cheap food, cheap education, and so on and so forth. And the system, I mean, the Soviet system in Russia lasted seven or eight years ending uh, in a very bad way. And uh, now, and, uh, I think the, the Arab or the MENA model has lasted less. And uh, so I was really struck by one of you mentioning that uh, is the unhappiest, these are the unhappiest country on the world except for South Africa. And um, so wh why? Uh, as inequality deteriorated, Gisela says, we don't know, but likely not. Um, as the price of oil and other primary commodities, which are financing all these goodies, deteriorated, not in the long term. If, if anything, they've gone up in real terms. So why then all this unhappiness? Well, one is that a lot of good things have been done. When I was in UNICEF, we did a study showing that basically the ratio between female and male education actually become one and uh, including in secondary education. Then they send them to school, they didn't send them to the labor market for the reason that somebody's been giving them on the podium. And, uh, uh, but at the same time, it is quite clear that there is uh, a large number of people who are unemployed and these are very well educated. So there is a revolution of rising expectations, which the state is unable to fulfill 
because they want to have well-paid jobs. The other possible explanation is population growth. So the population has grown, has grown too fast in relation to the amount of resources which has uh, uh, financing this. I don't know what is your opinion about that. Thank you, sir. Who would like to answer? I think I, I would agree. Population growth has uh, squeezed uh, the, the, the old system. So, and it's still squeezing the, the system, how it was set up in, in Saudi Arabia, for example. This is the reason for the transformation plan. You cannot simply employ everybody in the public sector. It's no longer possible. The private sector is not able to provide those jobs, and especially for the best educated. I, I would like to, to, to think about and may, uh, ask um, Shanta about, um, there is one phenomenon which you have in the Middle East is that people, economies are exporting educated people. So you would need the educated people in the home countries. Yes, you have some of them in the, in the, in the formal sector, in the government sector, but the pre this is what Shanta said, the demand for um, skilled labor is not necessarily there. So that is one, one crucial part, and this comes also with where the region stands in the global competition. It competes over low prices and not uh, over quality. So it, it ties back to what Mr. Gorbrecht said about the, the level of industrialization and all of that. So it is not an easy solution, but I would totally agree. Thank you. Um, we have... Should I try? You, you, you can answer, yeah. but then we have only 10 minutes left, okay. and we'll take those two questions together. Thank you. Uh, very quickly, um, I'm actually a little skeptical about that population growth explanation. I, I, you know, maybe it was because I used to be the chief economist for sub-Saharan Africa, and so when I moved to MENA, it suddenly looked like this place had already had a demographic transition, which it has. Uh, the fertility rates in most of the MENA countries are, 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 are low and, and uh, population growth is, uh, is stabilizing. There's a few exceptions like Yemen and, and uh, other low-income countries. In fact, in Tunisia, you know, Tunisia's fertility rate is below that of France. Some people think that maybe the migration is going to go the other way, but anyway, uh, <laughs> we'll worry about that. Um, so I think the questions of wh why they were unhappy um, it, it really is what we were saying earlier, the, 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 the lack of jobs, uh, the lack of public sector jobs, and the lack of private sector jobs being created, and the poor quality of public services, and the health and the education, and the fact that the, while you had the subsidized food and fuel, uh, it, that led to very poor quality uh, f uh, electricity, for instance. You have more blackouts you know, talking about blackouts in South Africa, you have more blackouts in MENA than any other region in the world, even than Africa. Thank you. Um, so very briefly, I think we have time only for two last questions or three. Um, sir in the middle, and then I think there was a person right here as well. Can you just be brief, please, and introduce yourself? Thank you. Yeah. So uh, I got to head in. I'm uh, from the University of Panthéon Sorbonne. Um, actually, uh, considering the discussion uh, between like privatization or public sector, South Africa launched uh, the first social impact bond for education uh, in Africa, the second in the world, and uh, basically this were, uh, this was uh, private investment uh, helping to fund uh, public and social services. So my question for the panel is: instead of having a vision very binary, either private or public, is it possible to imagine on the long, on the long run um, this, kind of, uh, this kind of financing? Thank you so much for the brief and precise question. I'll just turn to the next person who had a question, I believe. Yeah, thank you. Bonjour, uh, je suis Anne-Marie de Vorazek, je suis journaliste. Ma première question s'adresse à Monsieur Murray, et ça concerne l'Afrique du Sud. On nous a beaucoup montré l'exemple des Noirs d'Afrique du Sud. Quelle est leur part dans des 21% représentant la classe moyenne Ça, c'est la première question. La deuxième question s'adresse à Madame Gisela concernant le, les, les pouvoirs publics pourvoyeurs d'emploi. Moi, je m'occupe plutôt de l'Afrique et nous voyons qu'au niveau de l'Afrique, la Banque mondiale, le FMI, 
même actuellement, demandent de, de se délester des gens qui ont déjà un emploi. Alors, ce, je vous posais la question en tant qu'expert. Comment voyez-vous dans les temps à venir, comment la situation va, 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 va évoluer puisque le secteur public ne pouvant plus fournir de l'emploi, le secteur privé étant plus ou moins une jungle, comment voyez-vous l'avenir des gens dans ces pays-là Je vous remercie. Merci beaucoup, madame. Um, if we can please answer briefly, we have about five minutes. I'm really sorry, but we... You are almost welcome to continue discussion um, after the panel is over. Thank you. Um, perhaps, Marie, because I think these two questions were mainly addressed to you. <laughs> oh, I only picked up one. But anyway, um, the, the, a very excellent question about the role of black South Africans in the middle class, because that, that helps me finish where I started by saying the whole point of, of post-apartheid South African agenda was directed at transforming our society. Uh, and to some extent, the, the, the state of the black middle class reflects that. Remember, they're 90% of the population. About 50% now of the black middle class, which is the, you know, the, the more secure group, are black South Africans. So they're still hugely underrepresented. And that's a reflection in a dynamic sense of the failure of our society to transform. And the failure, for example, to give a many black South Africans tertiary education that they need to cope with the new environment. So that's the persistence of inequalities in South Africa manifesting itself. Um, and it's, it's even worse, so the elite, which is the top 4% group, um, are completely dominated by white South Africans still. There's no more starker representation. Uh, and, and for them, obviously, the labor market is not necessarily the key uh, dominates their earnings, etc. They get capital income and they get wealth, uh, returns on wealth, etc., etc. So, a very good question. Um, and uh, but but for South Africa really to go ahead, we do need th the black middle class to drive our agenda. So, uh, I like that very much. If I can make a very brief comment, because this is my last shot, right? Yes, um, absolutely. About. Uh, I just wanted to, 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 to wrap by saying I love the, the question about social justice because what I'm arguing for in a sense, and it wraps back to the social impact fund, um, I'm, I'm arguing that we're not going to get anywhere unless we've got that perspective that, that we're tackling social justice, it's a social justice issue from the state down, everybody, the whole society. That's the perspective. That's why I'm not very happy with, with very stark distinctions between public and private and things. It's all about getting done what needs to get done. And so your idea about the Social Impact Fund for Education is a, is a great idea, but you do want, that fund won't work if you, have, uh, if you refuse to confront a state that's not playing by the rules, that's not delivering on the Social Impact Fund. It's gonna unravel very quickly. So we are really in a collective action a problem here that we desperately need to solve. Thank you, Mary. Um, Shanta, perhaps we'd like to answer the person. About the? Yeah, the World uh, Bank. And no, I like that question about the, where are the private sector jobs gonna come from? That's exactly the right question to ask. Um, and I'm gonna say something somewhat controversial, and unfortunately we don't have time to expand on it, but I really, having studied, you did it this, on purpose. <laughs> having studied this for 15 years now, I'm convinced that the problem of private sector job creation in the Middle East and in Sub-Saharan Africa uh, has to do with elite capture. The government actually is captured by uh, a few elites who maintain monopolies in their countries and that stands in the way of private sector growth, of the competitive private sector growth. And I think South Africa certainly is an example of that, but this is a widespread phenomenon, and we have evidence in Tunisia and Egypt and uh, uh, other places to substantiate it. Uh, but let me just leave it at that. Thank you. Um, Gisela, would you like to add something to conclude or to answer some of the questions that were left? I think, I mean, I totally agree with the, with the capture thing, um, but that is um, a question which is not easy to address, especially in the Middle East, um, where you have uh, the, the middle class basically being the state. So it is, um, it is a very difficult phenomenon. Concerning the question of decreasing the public sector, 
when I was discussing that issue previously in, in the Central Asian context, a World Bank colleague actually said, we don't do that because the experience is that you drive them out through the door and they come back through the window. And it is basically what is also happening in the, in the Middle East. So after the Arab Spring, public sector employment was again on the agenda. That was th what governments know to do. So the question, I think what we, what we have to do in the spirit of the Agenda 2030 is to go beyond narrow sector fixes. We have to think in a comprehensive way like the SDGs are constructed to see what is influencing what and how can we act comprehensively from many angles to solve certain problems. Thank you so much, all of you. A lot of food for thought, for sure. And I invite now all of you to take a small break uh, for real food, if you please. Um, thank you so much for the audience for being uh, so nice and comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you a lot.